We'd like to welcome you to the Four Lakes Church of Christ tonight. We are getting back to our brand new study of the book of Exodus. So we'll be in Exodus chapter 2 tonight in just a few moments. I hope you'll find a Bible and be joining me there. But we're very glad that you've joined us. If you have any questions or concerns about class, if there's anything that we can do to help in some way, if there's something we need to be praying about either personally or as a congregation, uh, we invite you to get in touch. You can text us or call us at 608-224-0274. You can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can visit the website fourlakeschurch.org and use the contact information there. And we'll put that information on the screen in just a moment, and it'll stay there throughout our study tonight. You can also find us on social media by searching for Four Lakes Church, and we would also invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on notifications to be reminded whenever we go live or add something new to the channel. As I said, we're starting our brand new study of Exodus. We started last Wednesday evening. We are only two chapters in now, so we are ready for Exodus chapter 2. And like the book of Genesis, Exodus was also written by Moses the prophet. And we know this because Jesus attributes a passage from Exodus to Moses. We also know from Scripture that Moses is described as a prophet. And a prophet's job was to speak on God's behalf, and that is exactly what Moses does. Last week we saw that some time had passed between Genesis and Exodus, and in the opening verses of Exodus chapter 1, we found that a new pharaoh arises over Egypt, and this pharaoh does not know Joseph. In other words, this new one doesn't appreciate what Joseph had done for the nation so many years earlier. And by this time, the Israelites have multiplied tremendously. They have grown from about 70 in number way up into the perhaps lower millions. And Pharaoh is starting to get a little bit nervous. In fact, he's a lot nervous. These people may decide to join up with our enemies. And they may even decide that they need to leave the area. And that would be almost as devastating because they had come to rely upon the Israelites for their labor. And so in dealing with those fears... Uh, Pharaoh gets his wise men together, we assume, and he comes up with this plan that he will appoint taskmasters over them, basically enslaving them, preventing them from leaving. And then he also commands that all of the male children be killed and that they be thrown into the Nile River to drown. Uh, the Hebrew midwives, however, they fear God more than they fear the king, and so they disobey the king's command. And this, of course, is where we left off last Wednesday evening. So let's continue tonight by picking up with Exodus chapter 2, and we'll be beginning with the first four verses. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The first thing we notice in chapter 2 is that we have a man and a woman. And they're both from the house or the tribe of Levi. And this indicates, of course, that they are from the tribe that would ultimately get, be given the responsibility of serving as priest. Uh, this wasn't important at the moment, but of course it will be later on. They don't really know the whole priest thing at this point. That has not been introduced in the Law of Moses quite yet. Well, this man and this woman from the tribe of Levi, they get married. And we find in this passage that the woman conceives, she bears a son. And I would just note on this that despite Pharaoh's threats to kill all the male children, despite this man and this woman living together in slavery, despite the oppression that they were living under, uh, these two people still decide to get married. And that's kind of an interesting note here. We don't always need to wait for the exact perfect circumstances to get married. And we don't really need to wait for the perfect circumstances to have children. If we were to wait for the perfect circumstances to get married and to have children, nobody would ever get married or have children. <laughs> and I was thinking about that earlier today. If we waited until we could afford to have children, nobody would ever have children. So uh, I just find it interesting that here they are enslaved in Egypt, and they're still getting married. They're still having children. And so even in less than ideal circumstances, to say the least, these two get married. The woman conceives. She bears a son. And that, of course, means that according to the king's edict, this son must be thrown into the Nile River to die. 
However, because this particular child is beautiful, she does not kill him right away, but she hides him for three months. And on social media yesterday, some of you might have noticed that I asked what would have happened if this kid had been an ugly baby. Then what would she have done? I mean, some have suggested there are no ugly babies, that all babies are beautiful, and I understand that. I don't really know about that, uh, but I understand the thinking. I won't call out any examples, but... Uh, I think it might be safe to say that some babies may be more beautiful than others. Maybe we could leave it at that. I don't know. But uh, babies, I guess, are all beautiful to their mothers. Maybe that's true. But whatever the case may be, this baby is beautiful. And his mother, instead of killing him, as was the law at the time, she hides him. However, three months in, this is getting more and more difficult. I don't know if we can imagine going through this today. Imagine trying to hide a baby for three months. That'd be hard to do even... Uh, with what we have going on here today. You can't go anywhere. You can't leave the baby on his own. Uh, the kid needs to be fed constantly and changed and cared for and just on and on and on. That, that's a very difficult scenario. So when it gets to the point where she can hide him no longer, she gets a wicker basket and she covers it uh, with tar and with pitch. Uh, basically, she waterproofs it. Uh, I don't know exactly what those two things are. I mean, tar, we understand pitch. I kind of thought they were the same thing. Uh, but basically, for our purposes, she waterproofs this basket, covering it on the outside with these things. And then she sets the child out there in the water among the reeds by the bank of the Nile River. I'm kind of thinking the Yahara River, where it goes under the belt line. There are a lot of uh, reeds there, if we call them that. I've done some kayaking in and out there among some of those reeds. Kind of an interesting thing to do. Uh, but as parents, we can hardly imagine doing that to a child. Uh, even in the, the, you know, getting the best little boat together and putting them out there on the on their own in the reeds, just uh, uh, hard to imagine. Uh, but we also learned that this child has an older sister. And this older sister, as I understand this, stands watch over this little wicker basket floating in the Nile River. And I kind of wondered, well, why doesn't the mom watch over it? But we need to remember that they're in slavery. And so she's out there most likely making bricks along with everybody else. And three months was the longest that she could be away from that. And so when that three months is up, this is what she does. Um, so the child, I think we would agree, would be somewhat safe, but not safe completely. He's far enough away that the whole family doesn't get slaughtered if the authorities find him. Uh, but he's out there. He's in the Nile River. They have crocodiles and all kinds of wildlife and flooding and there's a current and uh, the sister, though, is keeping an eye on this young man. So thank God for sisters. Uh, they are good for something and uh, apparently very good at keeping an eye out on little brothers, uh, among many other things. But uh, let's continue with the next paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 5 through 10. Exodus chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, and said, Because I drew him out of the water. So notice, as this baby is out there floating among the reeds, Pharaoh's daughter just so happens to come down to bathe in the Nile. And she's there with her maidens, her servants, we would say, her entourage, and she sees the child. Maybe she hears the child first, I don't know, but uh, she sends her maid to go check it out. She brings the child to Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter feels pity on the child. So she feels for him. Um, I was kind of doing some reading, and some have suggested there is nothing quite so annoying as the cry of a baby. And it seems that God designed it in that way, that they cannot be ignored. And I don't know if it's necessarily 
annoying all the time, maybe annoying enough to get our attention in order to do something about it, but here in this case, it melts her heart. And so she feels for this child and uh, brings this uh, child to Pharaoh's daughter, and she has these feelings, and I, I think we observe here the difference between this like cold, hard law uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, what that law actually means up close and personal. You know, it's one thing to call for the murder of children, isn't it? That's, we, we can hardly even imagine, and yet, of course, today we can imagine that. But it's certainly quite another thing to actually see one of these children up close and personal. This is an actual human being that she's now holding in her arms. He's got a mother, a father, and in this case, a big sister. And so Pharaoh's daughter then, instead of immediately holding this child under the water until he stops breathing as her dad wanted to happen, she instead has some clarity of conscience here. And she takes him out of the Nile instead of throwing him back into the Nile like she was supposed to do under the law. Well, right at this moment, the big sister steps forward, doesn't she? And even before she says anything, think about how much courage that this must have taken for this young woman to do. And I don't know how old she was, but old enough to speak up, old enough to say something here, old enough to understand the plan. The law says this child has to die. And they've already identified him as a Hebrew, and now this Hebrew sister steps up. So it would have been much easier for this young woman just to say nothing. And yet we understand that there are times when we actually have to say something. And this is one of those times. And so the sister makes this offer. Shall I go call a nurse for you from among the Hebrew women that she may come nurse the child for you? What a brilliant move on her part. The kid is crying. He's obviously hungry. And so the sister basically offers to make the crying stop. <laughs> and she does that not by holding him under the water, but by offering to get him food. I'll go find you somebody who can nurse him. And it's amazing Pharaoh's daughter not only agrees to this, but notice she offers to pay the big sister for doing this. We could not have made this up. We could not have imagined a more perfect scenario under these circumstances. So not only is the child not murdered, but the child uh, is saved and the sister gets paid by the king's daughter for bringing the child back to his very own mother to be taken care of. Now imagine if the authorities had shown up at this house a few days later. Hey, we heard from your neighbor, somebody reported crying, and we heard you might have a baby boy in here family could have explained at this point that they were being paid by the king's own daughter to take care of this child. Do you see how that works? This child is now not only saved from the Nile River, but at this point he is now protected going forward because of this arrangement between the sister and Pharaoh's daughter and the child's mother. The child is cared for and grows and his own mother then brings him back to Pharaoh's daughter after some time, where he is then basically adopted into the royal family and is raised and trained and educated in the palace. And down at the end of this paragraph, we find that the child is named Moses by Pharaoh's daughter, indicating that he was drawn out of the Nile River. The name Moses then refers to being drawn out. And I guess I really hadn't thought about this before, but Moses is an Egyptian name. And so, you know, generically, Moses is an Israelite, or uh, ge genetically, I should say, um, Moses is an Israelite. Uh, but culturally, the way he is raised and the language he speaks and so on, is, he's pretty much an Egyptian. He's pretty much a member of the royal family. So he's kind of got this dual citizenship going on. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Exodus 2, 11 through 14. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw that there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other, and he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? 
Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. What amazes me here is that many years have passed by. Later, we're going to find out that this happens when Moses is approaching the age of 40. And let's remember, Moses is writing this. There is so much more that Moses could have told us about what it was like growing up in Pharaoh's household. But that's not the point of the book of Exodus. And so he completely leaves out nearly all details concerning his own childhood. We have this little blurb when he was born, and now we skip ahead, we fast forward until he's almost 40 years old. So he's born, he's placed in the Nile, he's rescued, boom, now he's grown up. All in just a few verses. Well, when he's grown, he heads out to his brethren. So he's out there scoping things out, and he notices an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And I hope you notice that we have the word brethren twice in just a few verses here. Moses was raised as an Egyptian, but at the same time, he also knows that he was a Hebrew. And I would ask, how does he know this? How does he have such a sense of identity as a Hebrew, or as an Israelite, we might say? Remember, he was raised for most of his life in the palace. But in those very early years, Moses was raised by his own family, even though they were being paid by Pharaoh's daughter. So I want to suggest that his parents, they got something right in those early years, and Moses never forgot it. Outwardly, he was an Egyptian, but on the inside, uh, Moses knew that he was a Hebrew. So as he heads out among the slaves, maybe uh, honing those uh, management skills that he's learned in Pharaoh's household, he goes out there and he sees that the Egyptians are overseeing the Hebrews, that the Hebrews are working hard. But he also notices an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and this Hebrew is one of his brethren. And in that moment, as I see it, Moses has this righteous anger kind of well up or rise up inside of him. Um, you know, this is one of my brethren. This is wrong. I've got the power to do something about it. And he does it, doesn't he? He looks one way, he looks the other. And once he makes sure that nobody's around, he strikes down the Egyptian, killing him. And he hides the body in the sand. I mean, I'm thinking it takes quite a bit to kill somebody with your bare hands or whatever he used. I mean, that's very, it's up close and personal, not some long distance thing like we're able to do today. But he goes up and he strikes down the Egyptian. And then he hides that body in the sand. You know, what might it tell us that Moses looks both ways before doing this? Does that tell us anything? I think, number one, perhaps he thought that what he was doing is wrong in some way. That's a possibility here. Or I think the second possibility may be more likely. He thinks it's right, but he still doesn't want to get caught by the Egyptians, does he? Because he knows that that will not end well. He will lose his own life as a result of it. Nevertheless, Moses, he sees this injustice. As I, as I understand it, it makes him mad. There is some righteous anger there, and he acts out almost immediately. So there's this sense of passion to do what he does here. Well, the next day, Moses goes out again, and this time he sees two Hebrews fighting each other. <laughs> and he steps in. Hey, you know, hey, what's going on here? And the, the Hebrew doing the striking responds pretty much by attacking Moses, doesn't he? I'm just paraphrasing here, but who put you in charge? Are you going to kill me like you killed the other guy, the Egyptian, yesterday? Well, at this point, Moses knows that somehow word got out, didn't it? about what he did the day before, and now he's afraid. That kind of thing has a way of spreading. And I would just kind of ask, how did word get out? He sees a Hebrew getting beaten by an Egyptian. He looks both ways to make sure nobody's watching, and he kills the Egyptian. I think it might have been the guy that Moses saved. I don't know. I wouldn't swear my soul on that, but I'm assuming that guy was there. I mean, obviously he was there. He was getting beaten by the Egyptian. And I'm assuming that he goes back and says, hey, you'll never guess what happened to me today. And one of these taskmasters was beating me up, and this guy named Moses comes in and kills the guy. And I, I'm just, just me, but I'm assuming that is at least, that's at least one possibility as to how word got out. Either that or somebody saw when he didn't think they were, were watching. But people were talking about this. 
And now Moses probably senses that his life is in danger. If not now, it will be very quickly because this will get around. So the way he sees it, he's wanted by the Egyptians. And he's really not completely trusted by the Hebrews. Moses is a man with no friends whatsoever. He's stuck in the middle here. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 2, verses 15 through 22. Exodus chapter 2, verses 15 through 22. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, Why have you come back so soon today? So they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why is it that you've left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses was willing to dwell with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershon. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Well, now that Pharaoh hears about this, he tries to kill Moses, just as he's probably now uh, wishing that he could have done 40 years earlier. Now he's going to finish the job. However, Moses makes a run for it. He lands in Midian, where he sits down by a well. And I don't know whether you've thought about this, but God's people have had a history of meeting women by wells, haven't they? I don't know if that ever happens today, people meeting at the water cooler or water fountain, but that's the way it happened in ancient times, it seems. Uh, you may remember Abraham's servant meeting Rebekah at the well. You may also think of Jacob meeting Rachel at a well. And then, of course, over in John 4, we have Jesus meeting a woman at a well to have this discussion. By the way, Jacob's well, in fact. So here Moses travels over to Midian. He uh, ends up at a well. Obviously, he would have needed water after such a long trip. And he just so happens to run into seven women, <laughs> all of whom are daughters of the priest of Midian. So these are hardworking shepherd women. They're out there with the flocks. But notice the men of the area drive them away. And they can't really do anything about it, so they're stuck waiting in line, I suppose. And Moses, though, sees this. And notice what happens. He sees injustice. He gets angry. He decides he can do something about it. And so he steps in, he intervenes, he helps out ultimately watering their flock. And so once again, he's going down the same path. I think we see a little bit of a pattern here. That God can use people like that. So the daughters go home. Dad wants to know why they're back so early. Well, they had help. There was this Egyptian guy who not only delivered us from the evil shepherds, he also helped us out and got it done. And Dad wants to know, well, where is the guy? You can't tell me a story like that and then not bring the guy home with you. What were you thinking? Invite him in for dinner. So Moses comes over for dinner. And this priest of Midian gives one of his daughters, Zipporah, to Moses as a wife. <laughs> and they have a son together almost immediately. And when Moses names the child, he gives them a name. Uh, gives him a name, recognizing that he is a sojourner, a traveler in a foreign land. All right, let's conclude tonight with Exodus 2, verses 23 through 25. Exodus 2, 23 through 25. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. We aren't given a timeline here in terms of the number of years, but we're told that after many days, the current king of Egypt dies. And the situation for the sons of Israel apparently gets even worse under the new king than it was under the old one. Because notice now, they're crying out to God for help. And God hears those cries for help. God hears their groaning. God remembers the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He remembers the promise. And God saw the sons of Israel. He takes notice of them. So God now, he's paying attention. Not that he wasn't paying attention previously, but now he seems to be paying attention in a way that he's about to do something about it. So that brings us uh, to the end of Exodus chapter 2. Before we move on from Exodus 2, I want to bring in a couple of passages from the New Testament that refer back to what we've looked at tonight, kind of before we close. 
And this, I want to start with a paragraph from the middle of Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council over in Acts chapter 7. But in this speech, Stephen is making a defense of the gospel. And he's making the point in this long speech or sermon, you people have misunderstood Jesus, just as you have misunderstood every leader that God sent to save you at all points down through history. And you're, you're making the same mistake with Jesus as you have over and over and over and over again. So he gives this history of God's people. And as he gives the history, we come to his retelling of the story of Moses. This is Acts 7, verses 17 through 29. Notice what Stephen says about what we've just read. And he's going to add some details that we didn't have in the book of Exodus. So let's keep an eye on this. He speaks of Abraham. And then this is what he says, starting in Acts 7, 17. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our father so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of forty, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Man, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. We won't, we won't dwell on this for too long, but we do have a few more details that we didn't have from Exodus, don't we? You know, this, for example, is where we know that Moses was nearing the age of 40 when he kills the Egyptian. Um, this passage is also where we learn that Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, that he was a man of power in words and deeds. And so we find here that he wasn't just raised by Pharaoh's daughter, he was educated by Pharaoh's daughter and that whole household. He, he was highly educated. Uh, but the point Stephen is making is that Moses thought the people were ready to be delivered from Egyptian bondage, but they weren't. They misunderstood, they missed it. And so Moses is now the hero, one of the patriarchs of the Hebrew people. Everybody loves Moses. But back then, the people didn't get it. And Stephen is saying, in the same way, you have also misunderstood Jesus. And I think I see a little bit of a shift in thinking. When I read Exodus, it's almost as if it may be Moses' fault. Maybe Moses jumped the gun, acted a little bit too early. Do you get that? feeling from Exodus, you know, maybe not really operating with God's authority and killing the Egyptian. But here in Acts, as Stephen explains that, that's not his take on it at all. His take on it was, Moses did the right thing, but you people weren't ready for it. And you didn't appreciate his leadership. By the way, when that uh, Hebrew slave said, basically, who do you think you are? Who made you leader over us? Does that sound familiar? To me, that sounds like the exodus from Egypt and all those years wandering in the wilderness, to me it seems like they said that same thing almost word for word over and over again. And so I'm just saying that started early and that uh, lack of trust in Moses' leadership, that is something that followed him really for the rest of his life. Okay, I'm sure there are other passages that refer to Moses, but uh, the other one that came to mind is found over in Hebrews chapter 11, 23 through 26. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we have what's sometimes referred to as the Hall of Fame of God's Faithful. The Hall of Faith, it's been called. So kind of just a list of famous faithful people and lessons we can learn from them. So let's notice at least part of it that's addressed to Moses. Hebrews 11, 23 through 26. By faith Moses, when he was born, 
was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Just a few quick notes on this one, starting with the reminder that Moses' parents hiding him instead of killing him, that's described as an act of faith. It won't be too long before we get to Hebrews 11 in our sermon series on Sunday morning, but in Hebrews 11, when the people are described as having faith, it's not because they felt something or thought something. And I think almost every case, it's because they did something. By faith, this one did this. By faith, this one did that. So it's more than a feeling. It's more than giving mental agreement or assent to something. But faith is something we do in the context of Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is an action. So by faith, he was hidden. His, his parents had faith in God. Therefore, they did that. The other part of this is that when Moses was 40 years old, he made a choice, didn't he? And that choice Moses made is a choice that all of us make sometimes daily. The choice to do what we know is pleasing to God, even though it might cost us something. Uh, in his case, Moses chose to give up the luxury of Egypt in order to endure hardship with the people of God. Moses, at the age of 40, he could have laid back, he could have enjoyed the luxury of Egypt, but he chose to give up the world. He chose to give up everything associated with the wealth that he had. And he instead decided to endure mistreatment with God's people. And Moses would spend the rest of, the, of his life with God's people, even though it would be extremely difficult. So he jumped out of the palace into this life of basically being a nomad and ultimately leading millions of people through the wilderness. Very uncomfortable, very difficult circumstances. And the reason is he's looking to the reward. He's looking beyond uh, what he experiences here and now. He's looking to what comes next. And I think that's a good reminder for us uh, that even today we also can look to the reward. And that brings us to the end of Exodus 2. And I think we have several practical lessons from this chapter. We've already looked at a few from the New Testament, but just based on what we've seen in Exodus 2 tonight, I'm hoping that we've seen the providence of God in this chapter. I know providence is how we sometimes label God's behind-the-scenes type care for his people. And it may not be direct, like the feeding of the 5,000 or like the crossing of the Red Sea. That's not providence. That's miraculous. That's God setting aside the laws of nature and doing something spectacular. But God will often take care of his people providentially, indirectly, in a way that may not be obvious until many years later. And in the middle of it, we may not see it. But looking back on it, we think, wow, that, that certainly seems that God uh, brought me through this situation. So tonight we've seen Moses preserved. I mean, starting with the fact that he was beautiful. If he'd been an ugly baby, who knows what might have happened. We might not even have uh, the book of Exodus. Uh, but then we've got his sister watching over him. That seems somewhat providential. God was using her to bring Moses through uh, safely. And then we have Pharaoh's daughter, who just so happens to have stepped out to bathe in the Nile River at, at the exact right moment. And she just happens to look over here and hear this baby crying and, and, and make that connection. And then we have Moses uh, cared for by his own mom, who's paid by the government to raise her own son in a time when he should have been killed by that same government. I mean, so many things just don't add up here. But looking back on it, it sure seems that God played a role in preserving him through that. So the providence of God. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you this coming Lord's Day morning at 930. We're getting back to our study of Obadiah. So we're, we're in a series of lessons this summer in uh, Sunday morning 930 class on the five one-chapter books in the Bible. And Obadiah is the only one from the old. And after these three lessons on Obadiah from Caleb, we're going to uh, take turns among the men of the church and work through the other one-chapter books in the New Testament for the rest of the summer. And then we'll come together at 1030 this Lord's Day as we wrap up our study of Hebrews 9 with Jesus serving as a priest in a greater sanctuary. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, any concerns, any prayer requests, uh, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. Give me a call. Send a text to 608-224-0274.
and we would love to hear from you. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, the God of Israel, we know that you are a God who cares for your people in times past, but also today. We understand that you care for us, providing our daily bread in so many new and unique ways, giving us places to live, bringing us together safely for worship. Today we pray for wisdom and we pray for the courage to choose to follow you, even when the world around us is so tempting, so appealing, when it's so so tempting to turn away. We pray, Father, that we would look to the reward and that we would not be distracted by the, the allure of sin. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, a prophet like Moses, who has saved us from our sins. We come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.